Hi, this is Sui. I hope you're okay. Um, I'm outside. Well, I'm actually in Kanyama right now. Um, if you remember a few months ago, I asked people to share contacts of friends or family that they knew who had a story worth sharing and that would share their story and see how others can learn from them. Today, I'm sharing the first of such many stories. This is a story of a 23-year-old young man named Alex. Alex dropped out of university because of financing. Now, he is working in order for him to raise money so he can go back to school. But the interesting part is that what he has to do for him to raise that money for school will send chills around your body. He has to do the unthinkable just so he can raise money for school. And my hope is that through the story of Alex, we learn to not take the things we have for granted, especially those of us who have a person in our lives that is paying for our education. This is a story of a 23-year-old young man here in Kanyama. Watch this. Okay, so I'm here with uh, Alex. Alex uh, is the gentleman I was talking about earlier. Um, he's going to share with us his story. He's got quite the interesting story. Um, I'll give him an opportunity to, to basically share his story um, with us. And I want us to start your story, Alex, from your university at um, your, your school at, at Lusaka Apex Medical University. I know that um, you, you did do your school there. Tell me about um, your experience at Apex. What happened at Apex? When did you go there? And then what came out of it? Yeah, okay, so I went by Apex, that was in 2015, after I completed my school in 2014. I was 16 years, yeah, 16 years. Uh, so Apex, okay, it was my first time being in university and I felt really young, pursuing a program, uh, pre-med, that was, I was doing pre-med for medicine, a degree program. So I learned a lot, as in, it was all school, to me it was just, my mind was focused on having to be maybe the youngest doctor because I didn't know anyone that would finish at my age. So for me it was all, I had that energy just wanting to be able to do my program and to be able to finish at a very young age. So when I was in my second year, first semester and I had to drop out due to funds, it really disturbed me as in I really felt bad. As in, I, I wouldn't describe how I really felt because it was something that was really eating me up from the inside. Like I would feel it, like I would feel the sadness, despite me having to understand my situation. But it was really that heavy on me that I couldn't bear it. At some times, I would maybe drop in tears when I was in my own, or when I was on my own in my bedroom, like that. And so, from there, after I dropped out, I didn't really just sit. I uh, went ahead and we started selling carpenter with my brother in Soweto Market, of which a lot of people maybe have seen me there and a lot of marketeers there. So we are selling, we are helping customers sell their bags of carpenter when they come with them from Sinazesi, Siavonga and the like. So we had a depot where we used to put their carpenter then. And in the morning around 05, we go there, we stack their bags, we start helping them sell those bags. Then we, there's, there's an amount of fee that people that get a bag used to pay let's say maybe 15 kwacha or 20 kwacha. Then from that amount, that it was just added to the amount of the bag. So meaning the 15 kwacha and the 20 kwacha, those are the money that we, we would earn at the end of the day. So it would depend if you sell 10 bags and you are getting 20 kwacha, then you knock off with the 200 or so. Okay. Yes. So so you were at Apex and Apex is, well, it's not a cheap school. How, how, how did you manage to pay for, for, for your education there? Okay, so uh, when I went by Apex, uh, it's dad that really advised me, knowing that I really wanted to be a medical doctor from the way go. So when my results came out and everything, he told me to apply by Apex. And everyone was okay with that because we knew the funds were available and would manage to fund for my education by Apex. So that's why uh, that's how I applied and started my, uh, my pre-med program by Apex University. But... You know, some, some things we never know how uh, they would turn out by the end of the day. Everything seemed fine, then all of a sudden, everything went sideways. Dad's business crumbled, and 
those normal funds to fund me into school. So that's how I dropped out. And since that happened, I don't think that has been able to put himself back up because it's like it's been really hard on him and it's been a struggle because from the way he used to work and the way he's performing now, it's something really different. You can see that, okay, things are really hard. You wouldn't even want to blame him for anything or you can't even blame him because he's tried. And for me to be able to reach this far, I think he's done a lot. And I just feel it's up to me now to help him out than having to wait for him to help me go back into school. So it's just been a burden on me now to find funds to go back into school. Okay. Yes. And and um, I do know that after the the, the business you're doing at Soto Market, then you left. Yes. Um, and after 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 you left Apex, did you ever go back to school? Uh, yes. 2017, I spent a whole lot of 2017 at home, but I was also applying to other universities before, before, before I went, before I applied to Rusangu University. That's why I went after Apex. I'd applied by Irene Horn, and I also tried by dental therapy, dental training school. Yes. So after I tried uh, by Irene Horn, they said they were offering some bursaries and scholarships. So after I applied, I thought maybe I would be able to get one, but I wasn't picked for a bursary, so I decided to apply by Rusanga University because at least the fees were cheaper then, and it was a degree program, so I decided to apply for environmental health. But initially I wanted to do biomedical science, so they told me ah, we don't have it at the moment, that's when I went for environmental health. And I did about a year, I, I did one, uh, my first year everything was okay. Then 2019, first trimester, that was in, that was in my second year, then uh, funds became an issue again. I was unable to continue, so I dropped out. Uh, yeah, I paused. I dropped out from Rizang University, and I've not gone back to school since then. That was 2019. Early January, to, I think early February, that's when I got a job by... Um, Murex Photo Studio in town. Yes, a friend of mine helped me find a job there. That's how I started working. We're making picture frames and framing photos. Oh, so it was something I was really trying to do. So um, from there, my focus was to be earning uh, the money that I was earning. I was planning to invest it in a chicken business because mom was running a poetry before so i had ideas on how to run a poetry so i was focused on running one so that i can at least raise enough enough money so that by the uh early 2020 i'll be back in school yes yeah, so that's how i started working and from the little i was earning i started uh investing in much business and it wasn't much it wasn't much we we're getting from there it was just uh yeah okay it wasn't much but at least I was able to keep something that helped me build the business. And I kept some monies. But uh, unfortunately, when it was time for me to go back to school, that, uh, I, that, was, that is Rusang University, to continue with my environmental health program, I was unable to continue because uh, my dad was sick then. And no one was there to help out with the funds for his medications and also help out with food at home and everything. So it was again something where you have money, but you cannot hold on to your money because you say you want to go to school and there are immediate needs at home and you need to help out. So I had to use the little I had, I had kept and I bought some, some for his medications, some for the food at home. And so I didn't have enough to go back into school. So I decided to, by then, I had already quit the job because I had already prepared my mind to go into school. Then everything happened and I was unable to go. So I stayed home. And the little I'd, I had kept uh, was used up also. So I was starting again from scratch, which didn't really, 
do me any good because my mind kept on breaking as in my spirit was really breaking i felt like i am i going to really manage to keep up like this because some people say it's not all about school but yeah it's never always about school but for me it was like everything wasn't running as i thought it would because be it school wise and financial wise and helping myself become stable was all a mess so it was really breaking me by the day that i wouldn't even notice myself become sad i would be happy and the next moment i feel sad because everything would come to mind and i just feel sad and seeing all my friends i was with and those that i was with in school having to push forward and others almost graduating was really something that really ate me up from inside because it, it it's something that you'd feel okay i would have been with them right now i would be completing with them right now i'm about to be doing attachments with my friends right now so i kept in touch with my friends like we still keep in touch we still talk and it was really something that out okay it's still something that eats me up up to now it's not something i would say it's really gone but something that when it comes to mind i feel bad like Uh, okay dropping out of school is not really something good and not being able to help out at home when you have issues is not something any better also it's something that it's someone up so long as you have the conscious of wanting to help and you have that thing in you of responsibility because I'm not the only one there's I have my siblings of my young brother and two young sisters and everyone else that stays here So it's really hard that you can't even want to hide or maybe hide the little you're having at the moment when you know there's something that's needed at home you definitely use up what you have also so it was really hard to save also from what was earning in the process to tell me now about the, the job that you're in at the moment uh, how did you find that job uh okay yeah right now I'm working at UTH as a motor attendant to as some people put it uh, malukula that's how a lot of people know it yes um in july after it had stayed home since january since january up to somewhere uh, june when the covid thing became serious and people started dying and there was a lot of deaths so the man power the motory was uh there was little man power the motory so my my mom's young sister works at the mortuary uh, at at the BID section as they do verbal autopsy so she had dreams of the story that they were looking for more mortuary attendants so she talked to one of the personnel that said then she was told that just told the person to apply so initially she was she intended to tell the young brother of whom uh refused he didn't like the job in the amount of money and the like so she called me she was like they they want motor attendants you can apply there so they like, oh, okay motor attendants so like okay i didn't really know what was involved in the job i didn't know what they really do but from the way they just knew okay motor that's where they put dead people so i said to write an application and the following day i took the application and she directed me to the person that I was supposed to give it to then after i gave them that form I waited for a bit and I was called by the HR to say come and sign your contract form and I went forth and apply, uh, and signed my contract form which is for one year as a casual worker so upon applying upon signing the contract we were told would be called on the date to report for work so on the 27th of June we were called to say okay you can come in now so that's when I went and waiting a bit outside then that's when the, uh, the other motor attendants came in and like okay they were told to orient us in what to be doing that side and for the guys that i found that side i think two of them or not three were already at least they knew what it was what was involved so it wasn't really a shock to them and like me was just going there for the first time i'd never been at the motorway before i've never seen dead people that much like it's maybe in funerals body viewing and the like but when i was that side it was something else it wasn't really something i was really expecting either to something beyond my imagination that really scared me 
Uh, so we started, they showed us the BID section where bodies first are, are placed before put in the mortuary, where everything is done, the registration and everything. Then we're taken to the court streams where they put the bodies now. So there's a BI, there's a court stream for the BIDs, where they put all the BIDs, B, it, R, T, A, the body was just missing, they found it, it's unknown, they just put them in the same place. So that's why you can find, that's why you find the most strangest things, like RTAs might find someone's head is broken and everything, the skull is open, eyes are out, or maybe someone was just tied on the neck, they'll be lying there, no one is covering them because they're just picked. So going in there was something that was really scary for me. As in, upon walking in there, I felt really hot, but it was a cold place that I was walking into. Looking at the dead bodies, they were everywhere, the smell, the scent, something that you've never really experienced before. I was really scared. I could feel myself sweat when I was in a place where I was supposed to be shivering. As in, it was, it was something else. It was really scary. That my mind keeps a lot of stuff so I could remember everything I was seeing at that point. Like, they, I could imagine everything because I've got a wild imagination. So it, was, it wasn't something easy for me to forget afterwards. Then from there, I was taken to the words. Uh, we were shown where we'll be collecting the bodies from after they pass away from maybe they die in the ward. They put them in the lay room. That's where you find the body when you come for collection. They showed us where to sign and they took us around. We went to the maternity ward. They showed us where we'll be collecting the, the dead ba babies from and everything. So we went back to the mortuary. And then upon reaching that side, we found a man. Uh, that works at the BID section. He showed us around, he showed us how to enter data in the BID book. Then after that, he took us down to the postmortem room where we found, where they conduct postmortems from. So it's, I've never seen the inside of a person before. So you find people have been cut open, wide open, everything is out. Then, yeah. It's, 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 it's not something I would say was easy to look at and just be like, oh, okay, this is what happens. It's something that you look at and it scares you and you might freeze a bit without knowing where your mind has wandered off to. You would just be there looking and someone has, someone has to shake me, hey, what are you looking at? Oh, okay, let's go. Because it's something that really shocked me as in, I wasn't really expecting all that at a very short period of time because it is it was in less than 30 minutes that I saw all that during the orientation so it was too much for my mind to consume so it was really bothering me in as much as I was doing it after the postmortem seeing where the postmortems were being done the same man asked me and a certain friend of mine that was starting together with he asked us to help him dress the dead body and prepare it put it in a coffin <laughs> So we had to help him, he was just like, okay, take off, take off the tops, take off the stockings. I've never touched, I'd never touched a dead body then. I'd never really come in contact with one. I'd just seen them in the, in the coffin, you just see them like that. But then I had to touch a person that was dead. Despite them being human but lifeless, it's too scary. It's not something that's easy for some, for anyone to be able to do like that. So. That's how we helped him dress up the body. And yeah, it, it, it wasn't a thin person. The, the, the person was huge. So it was looking at the person, the first stuck in my mind, because I used to watch too much horror movies. So it was something that wasn't really easy for me. So uh, we helped him, finished up the body, put it in the coffin and the like. Considering back then I was scared of even just coffins, like being around coffins it was something that bothered me like okay, coffins coffins like there are people that are still bothered by coffins despite them having nothing in them due to the fact that they put dead bodies in there so it was facing all my fears at once in a in less than an hour so it was something that was breaking me but i didn't really know what to do what i focused my mind on was i can i can do this if everyone that here is managing, then I think I will manage also. Despite the fear that I had in me, I was really scared. I still get scared at times. Then from there, um, I knocked off, I came back home. Oh, 
when I was still at work, well, they, they gave us a 50, like, oh, go and have some lunch. So I went to eat. And I don't know if, if it was just the food or maybe the scent and imaginations of what I saw, I, I, I puked out everything after eating. Like I felt everything coming back. I could feel the scent when I was moving, despite not being in the place. So I failed to eat. And yeah, I still stayed. We sat, waited for the time to knock off. We knocked off. I went home. After I reached home, uh, they prepared some water because COVID was high then. So I had to steam myself to make sure I was okay. I was safe. So I steamed myself. Then I tried to sleep, but truth is I couldn't sleep. No one would sleep after seeing such things. No one would really sleep. That's when I understood why they say most people that are that side mostly tend to become, they tend to abuse alcohol and other forms of drugs so they can escape the horror that's in their minds. Because that night I spent half of the night, if not the whole night awake, uh, I was terrified. I was really terrified. I was scared that I wouldn't even close my, my eyes to sleep a bit because everything I'd seen during the day kept on coming back to mind. So the only time I felt safe when, is when my eyes were open. So I played games on my phone, I listened to music just to make sure I didn't sleep. Then sometimes you'd sleep a bit, then again it comes back. Came morning, I, I really didn't want to go there. I just wanted to stay, but um, considering what I really wanted, I thought, okay, if I don't go and I quit right now, am I, am I going to be able to find something else to do? Will I be able to find something else that will give me a bit, a source of income? So I was like, okay, let me, let me just go, let me try again. So I woke up, dressed up, and showed up for work again. And it was the same process going into the words, the ideas, uh, helping people prepare bodies, because from the old motor attendants, it was the usual thing for them. So like when COVID was high, uh, there were a lot of dead, because there were uh, a lot of people burying their bod uh, burying, burying bodies then. So a lot of people needed people to help them prepare the bodies. Being maybe seven bodies to prepare, they tell you, okay, help me with this body, help me with that body. So yeah, they are just helping prepare the body, dressing them up and the like. It's not really in, in the line of my work, but something that you do, maybe to at least have money for lunch and transport money, because there is nothing that side that you can do that you can say can help you find money for transport. So we tend to do the body preparations when they are available so that you can find something for your transport and food and some basic needs during, before you get paid. So yeah, uh, that kept, uh, that's what we're doing. Uh, we helped them out. I was learning in the process. Despite me being scared, I was still doing it either ways because I just didn't want to give up and stop trying when I had an opportunity right there in front of me. For me, I, I looked at it not just as a job, but it's an opportunity despite whatever it was because I needed something to do and I always told people I'm ready to do anything so if you have anything and you think maybe you know uh, there's there's a charcoal business or anything as long as it's anything and it's there is money involved and we can raise money and it's authentic and legal then we can do it so I looked at it as an opportunity, despite it being a job from the mortuary and everything as a mortuary attendant. So I didn't want to miss that opportunity, so I kept on going and kept on trying. Most people tend to run away from their own words because everyone would say, okay, I'm willing to do anything, but when the reality of anything comes in, that's when you notice that there anything is limited to something. It's not anything that they are willing to do. So for me, that's when I knew, okay, I can do this. And I was, I was doing it, I'm still doing it. I still get scared. My first night, I, I couldn't sleep either because there's nowhere else you'd sleep. You have to sleep within the mortuary grounds. So when you're waking night, there's the places I'm, yeah. I'm sure many people have heard 
uh, rumors or they know okay there are a lot of stories and misconceptions about the mortuary and the mortuary attendants and what not so many people say uh, the mortuary attendants or Mamalukola they kill people they have hammers and the like but no that's not true no one would kill their fellow human being after they have if they have life in them so there is nothing when someone loses their life it's gone they're dead that's something I've learned. So, so you're telling me that you, you, you sleep there, like surrounded by these dead bodies? Yes, that's the only place you can sleep. You don't need to sleep far from the place where you're supposed to be waking from. So mostly you may, if, if you want some, some okay, they're used. So I followed pattern with what we're doing, the people that I was working with. Because in the group that I was put, I was the only one that was new. Everyone was already used. Like I have people that are, that have worked there for as long as before I was even born. Some have worked there for yeah, as my age, <laughs> been there for more than twenty years. Others thirty years. People have been working there for the longest time. So they are used. It's something that they would tell you like, okay, now is better than it was before. This is just something that is would say it's not worse like it was before. Okay. Like you would find a lot of dead bodies than you are finding now. So all of this, you have to go through all of this just so you can raise money for school. Yes. So I didn't I, I never I never stopped trying despite having failed businesses and having failed to go back in school and dropped out. I just didn't give up and and uh, let myself venture into uh, things that would destroy me by the end of the day because I should hide in a, in a saying that I'm depressed or something. So I kept my hopes high, high. So I decided to grab every opportunity that came my way. And this is the opportunity that was offered at the, at the moment. So I wouldn't let it pass. I told myself, you told yourself anything, this is something. Let me see you do it. So I would, I would, I would lie if I said I was managing on my own. But to be honest, it's all God. Like the things that we face every day, but it's not something you can manage from your own strength. But it's always God seeing you through everything, because He wouldn't put something in front of you that He wouldn't help you conquer or manage. So for everything that I've been facing and this job at the moment it it came in as a purpose for a purpose to teach me something because everything i've been doing and everything i've been through i've been learning in the process and i have grown when you work when you are there in the mortuary are there days when you think about quitting uh, every day i feel like quitting on every daily basis that i'm there because it's not it's not it's not a pleasant place to be and it's not really a good look sometimes when you come you're, you're handling dead bodies from the wards and you'd see the look people would give you as in you can even see that someone looks some people would look disappointed some seem terrified of you and just in me it's something that's really scaring me at the moment to be doing so I would, I would lie if I say I don't feel like quitting on every day basis that I wake up. I feel like I don't want to do it, but I, I really don't have anything else to do at the moment. So I wake up and should do it. So if it's something that I need to do for me to be able to acquire something by the end of the day and get myself stable enough to move back into school and get an education, then I'll keep on doing it till that time comes for me to move out. But for now, I cannot let myself quit. It's just the feeling that I feel, and I cannot give in in my give in to my fears. So I would have to conquer my fears for me to be able to pull through all this. But it's really hard. It's not something easy to do. I've seen adults break after going into the cold stream. Like you would, you know, you would find comfort in adult in adults. But sometimes you'd see them breaking, like you'd be like, okay, so this is really scary. Because there was a time someone brought in, like, you know, if, if uh, you know, 
from that side, you would now see that once someone loses their life, even the people that are close to you would tend, would tend to be scared of you. Like, they would bring the body, they would be just okay. But when it comes time, then they would... Like, the person, though, the person at home. But now that they are that side, they would be scared to hold the person without surgical gloves or anything. But they would come in with the person and all that. So it's not something easy to see. Like, you have to endure having to see people break because they've lost their beloved. You'd have to get used to seeing people cry every day, seeing people throwing themselves down because they lost someone. So it's not like you ignore that emotional part of you, but it, you can't manage to cry with everyone that comes there, but it still eats you up inside. I, I sometimes sit down and wonder if I'm still the same or maybe some part of me was torn off because it's an experience that it, I just, I never thought I would really go through. And I had to, I'm going through it right now just to be able to get myself stable and at least manage to do me a favor, maybe getting an education or maybe changing a situation at home and everyone else that's around me. So it's not really about me, but if I give up, then who do I let? I'm not letting myself down, but everyone else that's looking up to me also. Okay. So when you, when you, when you are at work, uh, you see these, these dead bodies. To you, are they just dead bodies or their faces that you constantly find yourself thinking about? Their faces that I constantly think about. Like I said, uh, I spent the three weeks failing to sleep because I would remember every single face I saw. Like, you know, there are certain times you dream of faces, like you dream of people that you don't know, but it's it's unlikely that you would see their faces. It's just the person they'd be like, okay, I didn't know that person and the like. But now I have faces to every person I dream of. I would dream of someone and be like, ah, you wake up, you'd be like, oh, it's the person that came in yesterday. It's this person, it's that person. You scroll through Facebook, you see someone posting RIP this, RIP grandma, RIP, RIP to my dad, my brother, family. you recognize faces from them. I know it's not everyone that I would know, but most of them, so long as they came in as BIDs, maybe at the mortuary, you'd recognize those faces as you scroll through Facebook, which is something disturbing for me even more as I do that, because I, nowadays I tend to skip those posts so that I just don't recognize those faces. I don't want to feel the pain. I don't want to feel that way because it's something that I don't think I can constantly handle. So I'd rather ignore such a post than having to recognize that face of the person, despite them not being close to me, but I'm human. Humans, every human, despite how much you might pretend not to care, we all care about everyone. So it's something that would it uh, that eats me up whenever I notice. So I notice someone posting someone I've seen at the court stream, and sometimes it's when they post like uh, a missing person, and you'd see the face and be like, wait, isn't this the person that the police brought in? So you'd be like, oh, okay. You notice the person, then after some days, be like, oh, the person that uh, picked them there, there that have been found at the UTH mortuary, then be like, oh, yeah, it's the same person as well. So it's not something easy. They're not just faces. As in, they're not just dead bodies. The faces I can recognize that I tend to remember sometimes. So if, if, if you got an opportunity and someone offered you a different kind of job that still makes it possible for you to raise some income and have enough money for you to go back and finish your education, would you quit your job? Yes, I would. Because I feel like quitting on a daily basis, but I can't because I don't have any stone to step on. So if something better was offered, I would definitely move because it's not a place that I'm happy to be at, but I'm just doing it because I need this to push myself to another place. And if I quit without having somewhere to step on, then I'm not doing myself a favor. So I'd rather find something that at least can give me that source of income before I plan on leaving that place. But so long as I don't have that yet, then I would have to enjoy whatever I'm going through at the moment till, I, till I'm able to achieve what I want to achieve.
Okay. What what lessons w- would you like other young people to learn from what you've gone through just for you to go to school? Because there are a lot of young people who take what they have for granted. They've got mom and dad or an uncle who's paying for their education, but they don't take it seriously. Some of them don't show up for school. They lie to their parents about where they are and they do all that because they know mom is there, dad is there, they'll pay for me. What what lessons would you like other young people to learn from you? You're only 23 years old, but looking at what you've gone through, the trauma that you go through, and all this just for school, and there are others that are taking it for granted, what lessons would you want them to learn from you? Mm. Okay, to be honest, uh, I, it, it's, really, it's really something that, that's, that bothers me to see people that have uh, enough funds for them to be taken to school and they just take it for granted. Like, you never know when reality is going to catch up with you. It, you don't know when that will be taken away from you. So it's, it's not right to waste opportunities. When you have something and you're being helped out, it's best, it's best you appreciate what you have and make sure you put in your best to be able to do what's necessary of you to do. Because not everyone has that. And why are you wasting what you've been given? And while others are out there struggling to be where you are at the moment, so if you were to look at other people and what they're going through, then you would understand and you would have that drive in you to make sure that you do what you can because you've been given everything at that time. So it's something that everyone and most young people should just understand that if you're if, if, if you being kept and everything is being given to you, don't take it for granted. Because even the people that are putting that on your table are struggling to find that, despite how much it seems to be easy to come through. But it's something really hard. Uh, it, you only understand or you only feel the pain of the drop of water when you carry your own bucket, so it has been said. So you won't understand till then when you're able to carry your own weight. Some people say, no, at you only know the pain of paying bills or living alone when you are using your own money. Because a lot of people are used, like, they would be in a boarding school, everything is given to them. They're not carrying their own weight. Someone else is helping, helping them carry that weight. But the day will come when you'll be able to carry your weight, then you'll now learn that you wasted a lot of time when you are not paying attention and when you had everything. So before you lose what you have, try make use of it and try appreciate the people that are putting in effort to make sure that you live a good life. A lot of people are struggling. A lot of people are going through diff- different type of things just to be able to make their lives stable and be able to do something for their families and put food on their tables. So appreciate what we have and make sure we do everything we can so that we live a better life tomorrow and not just waste opportunities. Thank you. Um, finally, um, if, if someone would like to to help you what what kind of help would you need what kind of work for example are you willing to do um in your quest to continue raising money for your school mm, if i if i'd put something specific then i would be limiting mes- myself and not only myself but someone would want to help so i'm open to anything any ideas or anything i'm willing to jump on anything that comes along so long as it's it, 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 it can help me financially then I'm willing to jump on it we can definitely have a talk or maybe bring the ideas on the table be it uh, capital wise or work wise or anything I'm willing to jump on it I don't want to limit myself to a few things but I leave myself open to anything that comes because from what I have been shown what I have learned my mind can accommodate anything and I know I can, uh, I can do anything so long as I put my mind to it, despite it being hard or terrifying, I can still manage. So I wouldn't limit myself to what I can do and what I can't do. It's anything and still stands to be anything. Okay. No, thank you very much, Alex. Thank you um, very much. You, you have a really touching story. I, I can't imagine you know, doing the kind of work that you do just to raise money. Um, but the fact that you're, you're able to do that kind of work shows how much you value education. 
uh, because other people would have aged. I'd rather try something else than be in a mortuary because it's, it's not the kind of life anyone would like to imagine for themselves or for someone that they love. But I, I really wish you were the best. What do your parents think of your work, by the way? Uh, they're not really comfortable with me doing this. I, I could tell from the time I just started working. It's something that bothered almost everyone, like even my elder brother, my mom. Like after the, after my first day, and I went back the following day. When I came back, they were like, ah, "You went back?" I was like, "Yes." But we thought we went. You weren't going to wake up to go back. I was like, <laughs> I I just had to go back. So it's not something that I've really dealt with and they're comfortable with, to be honest. But they've just accepted that. I need to do this so that I can find something by the end of the day. Okay. No, I, I, I wish you all the best. Thank um, you very much. Yeah, I wish you all the best. And I hope that uh, someone reaches out mm -hmm. and, and they're able to help you out. Because I like your drive, I like your motivation. I think you're a fine young man, you're very good, and your story is, is worth sharing. Thank you very much.